Okay, let's get to it. Acts chapter 4 is where we're picking it up today. Um, So growing up, I played soccer. I played kind of through high school. I wasn't very good, but soccer was kind of the sport I played. And so my entire soccer career, if you even want to call it that, I played as a defender. Now here's the thing about playing defense in soccer at that level. There's not a lot of glory playing defense. You don't get a lot of recognition playing defense in middle school and high school soccer. It's one of those things where you either do your job perfect and nobody notices you, or you mess up and everybody knows you're the reason that your team lost the game. Like, nobody cares about the people playing defense. Like, just yesterday, literally just yesterday, in the family group chat for my wife's family, my sister-in-law sends a text with a video, video of my um, nephew Noah scoring a goal. And then she's like, Noah got a hat trick today. That's three goals in a game. Like, Noah got a hat trick. Isn't that awesome? And everybody's replying like, way to go, Noah. You're awesome. You're the man. You know, good job, Noah. A few minutes later, uh, my sister-in-law sends another text. Oh, and Ben also had a great game as a defender. Nothing. Crickets. Like, no one's like, good job, Ben. Way to keep him out of the goal. Like, no one cares. Like, it's all about scoring goals. That's how you get the glory. So I played defense my entire soccer career. Nobody ever noticed me. Nobody ever cheered my name. I never got any glory. And so the last year of playing high school soccer, I'm like, hey, I'm going to get a goal. I'm going to score a goal because, man, I've been doing this whole, like, team thing my entire life. It's time for me to get some glory. It's time for me to pe- for people to see how good I am. And I think I've told you guys this story before, but so we're playing a game one day, we're up a couple goals, so it's not close, so I get the ball back on defense on our side of the field, and in my mind I say, this is it. This is my moment. I'm not passing this ball, I'm taking it all the way down the field, and I'm going to score a goal, and everybody's going to know how awesome I am. Now here is the only problem with that plan. I'm a terrible soccer player. Like, I'm not any good. So this was a terrible idea to start with. But in this moment, like something that I can't explain happened. It was like the spirit of Pele overtook my body, and for a span of like 10 seconds, I turned into a decent soccer player. So I take off down the field, and it was sort of like in the movies when things stop, and it's like slow motion, and there's the dramatic music playing over top of you. I'm just cutting through defenders. I'm dribbling the ball through the other team's legs. Like I make it past every single person on the other team, and it's me, the goalie, and a wide-open goal. And I don't know if you've seen a soccer goal lately, but it's pretty big, right? Pretty big area. And so if it's just you and the goalie, all you have to do is tap it in, and it's an automatic goal. So it's me, the ball, the goalie, and a wide open net. And so in this moment, I think, man, I've come this far. I've made it all the way down here so people know how awesome I am. I'm not tapping this ball in. Man, I am crushing this ball past the goalie. So man, I rear back, I kick it as hard as I can. I kind of turn to run and start celebrating. And in a split second, it was like everything returned to full speed. The dramatic music stopped, and I just hear, dong. And I look, and the ball bounces off the crossbar. And I can just hear my coach screaming from the sideline, like, Purvis, who do you think you are? Get back on defense. What in the world do you think you're doing? Man, I thought I was going to get all this glory, and everyone's going to know how awesome I was, and I ended up looking like an idiot. And here's what I learned in that moment. It's an important life lesson that's generally true all the time. I learned in that moment that whenever we try to seek out glory and honor for ourselves, it usually doesn't go very well for us. That's exactly what we're going to see today in Acts chapter 4 and 5. In this story, Luke, who writes Acts, he's going to contrast two different kinds of people. So he's first going to uh, show us, he's going to tell us the story of this guy named Barnabas. This is a guy who was a humble guy. He was a selfless guy. He's a guy who didn't care about getting glory or honor for himself. But Luke is going to contrast Barnabas with this married couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And they are, on the other hand, they are proud and they are greedy and they want glory for themselves. And what we're going to see is this first guy, Barnabas, he comes to the church understanding, hey, the church is a family and it's this family that I come to so I can give of myself. I come to the church to lay myself down, to give of myself, to humble myself for the sake of others. But in contrast with that, Ananias and Sapphira, we're going to see that they come to the church in order to receive what they want. They come to church so they can have their own desires satisfied and filled. And their desires that they want filled are glory and honor 
for themselves. And what we're going to see is that when we approach the church with this perspective of, hey, what do I get out of it? How can I use the church to get what I need? God doesn't take too kindly to that. So Acts chapter 4, picking up in verse 32. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Listen to this. It says, there was no needy people among them. No needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. So the picture Luke paints here is that the gospel, meaning the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, had so transformed these people's lives to where they now loved one another so deeply that Luke says they didn't even consider their possessions to be their own. That they had such a deep love for one another that if somebody else in their community was in need, if they needed to, they would go sell property to meet those needs. Of J.D. Greer, another pastor, I love what he says about this. He says that the gospel had loosened the grip on their stuff and tightened their grip on one another. That the good news of Jesus caused the, the, the grip that they had on their stuff to be loosened, but it tightened the grip that they had on one another, that because of what Jesus had done, they were transformed to where they were living such humble lives, such humble lives, and that's what it is, that they considered each other to be more important than their stuff. So then what Luke does is he kind of dives in and he gives a particular example of this in action. He says, for instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. And here's what Barnabas did. It says, he sold a field he owned and he brought the money to the apostles. Luke said this first guy, Barnabas, he owns this piece of land and he's doing okay. He he doesn't need the land to survive himself. So he hears of some needs and he goes and he sells that land and he brings all the profit. He brings 100% of the profit And he lays it at the apostles' feet and says, hey, here you go. Use it to do ministry. Use it to meet needs. Now, real quick, go on a tangent for just a second. This passage deals with money. It deals with um, giving. It deals with generosity. But I, I don't think that this passage is necessarily about money and giving and generosity. I don't think that's the main point here. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But I do want to talk about this whole idea of generosity real quick. Because for those of us who are Christians, and if you're not a Christian, like this isn't for you, just kind of check out for the next minute or so. Those of us who are Christians, um, we are called to bring what is called the tithe to the local church. A tithe means a tenth. It's a 10% of our local income. So we are called to give 10% of our income to support the ministry and the work of the local church. Now, if you stick around church long enough, there, there's kind of this debate about the tithe. And the debate is, well, the tithe was instituted in the Old Testament. It was instituted for the nation of Israel. And so now we're in the New Covenant era. We're, we're living you know, after the New Testament, so the tithe doesn't really apply anymore. It's not a command that we have to follow. It's just kind of a principle now. Now, I, I personally would, would disagree with that, and, and here's why. You know, don't murder, don't steal. Like, those things were instituted in the Old Testament for the nation of Israel, but they still apply today. And the reason we know they still apply today is because they are affirmed in the New Testament under the New Covenant. And the tithe is as well. Jesus actually says in Matthew, he says, you should tithe, yes. And he says, just don't neglect the weightier things like mercy and love and things like that. So, so I, I believe as Christians today, I believe we are still commanded to tithe, to bring a tent to the local church. But, but just for argument's sake, let, let's imagine I'm wrong on that, because I very well could be. I don't know. Let's imagine I'm wrong, and we are not under this command to tithe anymore. Let's say that we're, not, we're no longer under the law. Now we're under grace. Okay, then. If we're no longer under the law, and we are now under the grace, then how should we give? What does is, what is Barnabas, who's under grace, filled with the Holy Spirit, what does he do? Man, he doesn't tithe. He sells a piece of land. He brings 100%. Right? And, and so the point is, is that living under God's grace should compel us to even greater levels of generosity than the law could ever command us to follow. Right? If we're no longer under the law, if we're not obligated to tithe, and we're now under the new covenant, we're under God's grace, I mean, that, that should push us further in our generosity than the law could ever ask of us. 
And so we see Barnabas living this out. And he, he doesn't say, hey, I need to bring a tithe. No, God has so transformed his heart. He said, man, I am bringing it all. I'm giving it all. So he sells this land. He brings the money and he lays it at the apostles' feet. And here's the implication here. The implication is that Barnabas doesn't do any of this for recognition. Barnabas didn't do this. He didn't come to the apostles to get credit, to get glory, to get honor for himself. He, he's not coming and saying, hey guys, listen up. Um, I, I heard that, that our town needs a new homeless shelter. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell this land. I'm going to donate money for the homeless shelter. But the only thing I ask is that the entrance of the homeless shelter, once, a bit, once it's built, we get this huge gold plaque that says, that, you know, the Barnabas Memorial Homeless Shelter, so that people know I'm the one who gave the money for it. Now, there, there's none of that here. Right? There, there, there's, for Barnabas, there's no desire for glory. There's no desire for recognition. There's no desire... For, for honor. It's simply, Jesus has changed my life, and so here's what I want to do with this. Here's this money. Use it how you see fit. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of us want to, and even deeper than that, how many of us sort of crave, how many of us would kill to be part of a community filled with people like Barnabas, right? Filled with people who are humble. Filled with people who aren't you know, about what's in it for me, people who aren't self-serving, people who are worried more about the needs of others than they are about their own needs. How many of us want to be part of a community filled with people like that? Like, lift your hand up. All of us, right? All of us. Here's another question. How many of us are willing to actually do what Barnabas did? <laughs> right, yeah. Well, that's a different story, right? We, we all want to be around people like Barnabas, but I don't know that many of us want to actually be like Barnabas ourselves. Here's this guy who, and he's, he's not asking, what's in it for me? It's not about honor and glory for his name. And what's fascinating, just as a side note though, Barnabas isn't seeking out glory, but you know what? He gets it. He ends up getting honor and glory. I mean, we are talking about this guy 2,000 years later. He's not seeking his own glory, but God gives it to him, which is such a reminder for us. Hey, like, do the right thing, whatever the right thing is, do the right thing and leave the results in God's hands. Right? If you do the right thing and nobody notices, nobody cares, so what? God sees it every time. Leave the results in his hands. But notice this about Barnabas. He, he comes to the apostles, he comes to the church with open hands. Not, not about saying, hey, what's in it for me? What can I get? But he comes saying, hey, here's what I can give. Saying it's not about my name being honored. It's about God's name being honored. Put most simply, Barnabas has this perspective. Barnabas is living in this mindset where he believes, and his actions show that he believes the church is not about him. The church is not about what he gets out of it. It's about something bigger than that. So that's Barnabas. So then what Luke is going to do is he's going to contrast Barnabas with this married couple, Ananias and Sapphira. And this is what he says about them. He says, but then there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. All right, so they sold some property just like Barnabas did. He says he brought part of the money to the apostles. So he didn't bring all of it like Barnabas. He brought part of it. But here's the issue. It says he brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And listen to this. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. I would say so. It says, Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for the land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, How could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the Spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. And instantly she fell to the floor and died. 
When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear gripped the entire church and everyone who heard what had happened. Pretty intense stuff, right? The, the, the picture that Luke is painting here is that Barnabas, he did this good deed out of selflessness. He did this good deed out of humility, not out of a desire to get recognized by others, not out of a desire for people to pat him on the back and say, hey, way to go, Barnabas, man, that was such a good thing you did, not for his own glory. But as a result, people praised Barnabas. Apparently somehow the word kind of got out and people knew that Barnabas did them. Like, hey, did you hear what Barnabas did? Man, that's awesome. What a good guy. He wasn't seeking that out, but apparently that's what happened. And so the picture here is Ananias and Sapphira, they say, hey, we want people to say the same thing about us. But the same way everybody's talking about Barnabas, we want them to talk about us. We want them you know, to think that we're as good as Barnabas. We're as generous as Barnabas. We want some praise too. We want them to see how awesome we are. So like Barnabas, they sell some property. But as it said, unlike Barnabas, they didn't bring the entire proceeds of the sale. They only brought part of it. But they claimed that what they gave was the full amount. Right, so again, the picture, they sell this piece of land. Let's say they sell it for 100 grand. They come to the apostles and say, hey guys, good news, we sold this land for 50 grand, so we want to give all the money, we want to give the 50 grand to you guys to do ministry, to help people to meet needs, and then they pocket 50 grand for themselves. Now, the text is clear here, that the issue, the problem, has nothing to do with the fact that they didn't give all the proceeds from the sale of the land. That, that's not the issue. Peter even says they're like, it was your land to do with what you wanted to do with. Like, you didn't have to do this. Nobody forced you to do this. God wasn't making you do this. And then Peter even says, and even after you sold it, you could give however much you wanted. He says, but you lied about it. You deceived. And notice what Peter says. He says, you didn't deceive us. You were deceiving the Spirit. We've got to remember, ultimately, when we sin against one another, yes, that matters. We have to make that right. But ultimately, when we sin, we are sinning against God. Right, that's what they do. They, they come and they lie, claiming they're giving the full amount when they're holding back some for themselves. Now, again, why would they do this? Why are they doing this? And again, to understand why, we have to remember the context here. This, this story is contrasted with the story of Barnabas. Barnabas was humble. Ananias and Sapphira, they are proud. They wanted the same kind of glory. They wanted the same kind of recognition that Barnabas received. But they said, hey, if we have to, we will lie and cheat and steal our way to get it. So whereas for Barnabas, the church was all about what he could sacrifice, what he could bring to the table, what he could give for the sake of others, for Ananias and Sapphira, the church was simply a tool that they could use to get what they wanted in the moment out of it. And what they wanted in this moment was glory and honor and praise for themselves. The church was simply a vehicle that they could use to get what they wanted. And don't miss how serious this is. This is so serious that God struck them dead instantly. Now, if you're new here and you're a little creeped out, um, let me reassure you that at least as far as I'm aware of in our 80-year history as Garden Oaks, I don't think anyone's ever been struck dead in a Sunday morning worship service. I could be wrong on that, but I don't think that's happened. So I think hopefully you're good. Right? But like, that's what happened here. Like This is intense. This is no joke. This sense of pride. Look, look at how God views us. This, this sense of pride. The sense of using others to meet our own selfish desires. And again, for, for Ananias and Sapphira, their selfish desires was praise and glory for themselves. That sense of prize, that sense of glory for ourselves, that sense of making sure we can twist and, and turn and do whatever we can so everybody lifts us high. God takes that so seriously. He says, I can't have that in my church. I must root it out immediately. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you may kind of pick up a little bit that this story has a lot of kind of, you know, subtle parallels to a story in the Old Testament, the story of a man named Achan in the book of Joshua. 
In the book of Joshua, what's happening is the people of God, the Israelites, they've been freed from generations of slavery in Egypt. They are headed towards the promised land, but on the way to the promised land, they have to fight against these various tribes of enemies on their way into the land. And so before one of these battles, the famous battle of Jericho, God tells the Israelites, he says, hey, don't worry, don't be afraid when you come up against these enemies. They may be bigger, they may be faster, they may be stronger, they may be more in number, but I'm going to go before you. I'm going to fight for you. I will defeat your enemies on your behalf. So before the battle of Jericho, God says, hey, when you defeat Jericho, or really when I defeat Jericho for you, he says afterwards, don't take any of their treasure for yourself. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. God gave them that command. So they go. They defeat Jericho through the power of God. And after the battle, this man named Achan, he disregards the command. He goes. He takes some of the treasure for himself, and he buries it under his tent. Keep going in the story. A chapter later, they come up to another battle. But this time, God doesn't fight for them. The next battle, they lose They are defeated as judgment because of the sin of this one man. And eventually, Achan himself is put to death as judgment for his sin. You see, in that story back in the Old Testament, the people of God had a mission in front of them. And their mission was to go and enter the promised land. But the success of that mission, don't don't miss what happened there in the Old Testament. The success of that mission was in jeopardy because of the sin of just one man. And so that man experienced judgment. Because of the sin of one man, the entire community was in danger of not accomplishing the mission. And so to protect the mission of the community, that man had to be put to death. And so here in Acts, you know, you, you, you may sit back and say, man, like, this is harsh. Why would God do that? What's the deal? Well, remember, the church in Acts, they had a mission. It wasn't to go and enter the promised land. Their mission was the Great Commission. It was to go and take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to all nations. To go and make disciples of all people, of all nations. That's what the church is to be about. Making disciples of people of all nations. And the reason that the judgment of Ananias and Sapphira was so severe was because their prideful self-centeredness was threatening the mission of the church. Whereas the church is supposed to be about about humble selflessness, where we come together as a family and we all bring our individual unique gifts to the table and and we ask, how can I use my gifts to make disciples? How can I use my gifts to serve others? How can I use my gifts to show the world the love of God? They had made the church a place where they came and said, how can we use the church to get glory for ourselves? How can we manipulate the people of the church so that it's all about us and we're the ones receiving praise and glory and honor? And God would not allow the mission of the church to be stopped, to be thwarted, to be hampered by these two self-centered people. And so I think ultimately in the story of of Barnabas and of Ananias and Sapphira, I really think it's like a compare and contrast of two different ways we can view the church. Two different postures that people bring into the local church. And so it's this question of do we view God's church in this self-centered way where we approach the local church saying, hey, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? Or... Do we approach the church, do we view the church in a selfless way, saying, what can I give to it for the sake of others? Ananias and Sapphira, it was the self-centered way. Again, the church was all about what they got out of it. But for Barnabas, he approached the church selflessly, saying, what can I give for the good, for the sake of others? And so real quick, well, let me just ask a couple questions to try to help us discern in our own hearts like which side of that spectrum we are on. If we are currently living with a heart that is more like Barnabas or if we are living with a heart that is more like Ananias and Sapphira. Here, here's the first question. When you come here to church on Sunday mornings, 
Do you come asking, hey, I wonder what I'm going to get out of it today, or I wonder what I can give today for the sake of others? Like when you wake up on Sunday morning and you're getting ready to come here, like which posture more reflects your heart? What am I going to get today, or what am I going to be able to give today? When you come here on Sunday mornings, are you, are you asking, hey, I wonder, I wonder how the staff, or I wonder how the deacons, or I wonder how the leaders are going to serve me today? Are you asking that? Or are you asking, hey, I wonder how I'm going to find an opportunity to serve somebody else today? Or which one is more your posture when you come here? How am I going to be served today, or how am I going to serve Right? When you come here, are you making this, this mental checklist? Or, oh, man, like, here's all the things that I don't like about the church. Here's all the things that I think you know, our, our church does a bad job of. Here's all the things that annoy me. Is that your mindset? Or do you come saying, hey, here are all the ways that I could use my gifts to make my church better? Right? Like, which one are you? you got the mental checklist of everything that the church gets wrong. Or, hey, here's how God has empowered me to help make it right. And make it better. Right, right? Do you, do you view the church like Ananias? Like, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about glory for myself. It's about me humbly laying down my desires, my needs, my wishes for the sake of others. Or is it like Ananias and Sapphira? You come here saying, hey, what's in it for me? What am I getting out of it? Listen, as we close, uh, most of you have heard the statistics, like we've talked about before, the statistics that every single year in America, thousands and thousands of churches die and close their doors and cease to exist. Right? Before COVID, even before COVID, more churches in America were dying each year than new churches were being planted each year. Churches were dying at a faster rate than churches were being birthed. And obviously, as you can imagine, COVID, we don't have like statistics quite yet because we're still kind of coming out of that, but COVID has only exacerbated those statistics. But here's the hard but the sad reality. The majority of churches in our country that are closing their doors and ceasing to exist every single year, they die with people in them believing that the church was all about them instead of believing that the church was all about accomplishing the mission. right? In, in fact, it's incredibly rare. It may happen at times, but it is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare for a church to be filled with people who come together and say, hey, we're not here for ourselves. We're here to give. We're here to sacrifice. We're here to lay down our needs. We're here to lay down our desires. We're here to lay down our preferences for the sake of taking the gospel to our neighborhood. It is incredibly rare for a church filled with that kind of people to close its doors and die. It just doesn't happen. Typically, the churches that die are filled with people clinging, clinging even to death, to their preferences. Saying, well, here's what we want our music to sound like. Here's what we want our church to sound like. Here's what we want our programming during the week to be like, instead of saying, how can we leverage those things for the sake of making disciples in our community? Uh, Now, just in closing, for those of you who have been here for years and years and years at Garden Oaks, let me just say that you deserve massive credit where credit is due. You really, really do. Because for years, like, like thousands of churches in America, for years, the reality is that this church was slowly creeping towards death. It was slowly creeping towards not existing anymore. When Pastor Greg was the interim pastor here, he, he would get calls all the time from, you know, huge mega churches um, here in Houston saying, hey, you know, can you all just close your doors finally and give us your building? Like, uh, that was the direction that this place was headed in. And I think part of the reason for that is because our natural tendency as human beings is over time for our attention, for our focus to drift inwardly, right? That's just, that's all of our natural tendency, young, old, male, female, black, white, Latino, like that's all of our tendency. Over time, we drift with an inward focus. And again, that's 
what happened here is, well, what do we want our church to be like? Like, what, what do we want our church to look like? Instead of saying, what does our community need? And so the slow drift towards death, but a couple years ago, you guys as a church, you unanimously voted to say, hey, we can't keep doing that. The mission is more important than our preferences. The mission is more important than our desires. And you guys said, hey, this neighborhood is our mission field. And we are going to do whatever it takes to reach our mission field, to reach this neighborhood. And so listen, for those of you who have been here for decades, I know that's not easy, is it? I know that that things have changed. And and I know that for for some of you, the pace of change may feel way too quick and way too rapid. But here's the deal. You've rolled with it. You've stuck with it. You are still here even if it makes you uncomfortable at times because you have said, it's not about me anymore. It's not about what I want. It's not about my needs. It's not about my preferences. It's about making disciples of lost people here in this community with the good news of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart, we're starting to see the first fruits of that happening in part, in large part, because of your faithfulness in that. Right? Because you, you've made this shift of saying, all right, when we come into the church, you know, I've, I've got ideas, I've got preferences, I've got desires, but that, that's not the main thing. The main thing is the mission. And so listen, as a result of that, here's the cool thing. Those of you who are new here, if you're new here and you're like, man, like, I, I'm so glad to be here. I feel like I've found a home, like I feel comfortable here. I can, I can be encouraged and I can grow and I can learn in my relationship with God. Like, if that's new, or if that's you and you are new here, the reason you're here is because those people who have sacrificed so that you could be here. That's why you're here. And so let me just say, and I am proud of you guys. I really am. I think too much, you know, pastors get up and kind of beat up the congregation. So I don't want to, I want to say I am really genuinely proud of you guys because I believe that God's Spirit has been growing and changing and transforming this church. We're, we're, we're shifting. We're not a church filled with people like Ananias and Sapphira. We are becoming a church filled with people like Barnabas. And here's why that's so important. Here's why that matters. Even more than it matters because it moves the mission forward. It's because when we start coming to the church with open hands saying, it's not about me, it's not about my desires, it's not about what I want, it's about what I can give for the sake of others. The reason that is so critically important is because when we do that, it's making us more like Jesus. It's working toward that long, slow process of sanctification in our hearts. Right? When we act like Barnabas, we're not actually acting like Barnabas, we're acting like Jesus because Barnabas was simply acting like Jesus. Because why did Jesus come? Not for himself. Not to be served, he came to serve. He came to give himself for the sake of others. He came to die in our place so that our sin could be forgiven. He came so that we could receive grace and mercy and forgiveness. He didn't come for himself, he came to give of himself for us. And so when we live like Barnabas, if you're a follower of Christ, when we live like Barnabas, And we come to the church, and then we leave the church, and we go into our communities, and we say, it's not about me, it's not about my needs, it's not about my desires for today, it's about what I can give for the good and for the sake of others. When we do that, we are really showing the world what Jesus, our Savior, is like. And that's what we are called to do. Let me pray for us.